Hello and welcome to the Leaders Room. I'm Kate Sweetman of ICLIF and I have with me today Charles Ledbeater. He's the author of We Think. He's also um, a, an advisor, an innovator, and an author of, of other books. I know you have a new one coming up, coming out shortly. The Frugal Innovator, the frugal which innovator. comes out in April, May 2014. Fantastic. The Frugal Innovator, in, it, innovator coming out next month. Thank you, Charles, and thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Um, as you know, we are a leadership and governance center here, and so I'd love to have just a short conversation with you that talks about your work in the context of leadership. Mm. So first of all, could you give us an idea, what do you mean by we think? What are you talking about when you say mass innovation, not mass production? Well, I suppose what I mean is that with technology combined with new values, um, people can be organized in ways without having an organization in a traditional way. So people can now come together and achieve things through networks and communities using technology that previously they would have needed a very large organization with a hierarchy and a bureaucracy to achieve. And so this is opening up entirely new possibilities, new forms of organization. And those new forms of organization respond to quite different kinds of leadership. So whereas with a large bureaucratic organization, you might have had quite instructional leadership of an authoritarian kind that depended on its position, if you're trying to lead a community of people with like interests but who are to some extent independent, you need a leadership which is about influence and about inspiration and about effectiveness, not about position. Yeah, that's very interesting because we read things like Wikipedia and it all sounds like the crowd is always going to be smarter than any individual and that's the way it's presented. But one of the things I saw in your book is that this notion of we think really needs a core. And I guess what you're saying is that the leader provides that core? Yeah, so none of these big collaborations or these big, like Wikipedia or open source software even more, which is, a, is the kind of classic case I suppose, just get going out of thin air. Someone has to put in some extra effort to get it going and start the community. And often those people, whether it's the first traders on eBay or it's the first contributors to Wikipedia, form both the core and set the tone and the kind of values of the organization. And you see this also in big scientific collaborations as well, that the human genome was mapped by people who had collaborated on previous projects. And those projects, they set the sort of tone and the values which then led to the way that they collaborated. So there's no such thing as a kind of uh, an organization without any kind of structure or relationships of power. But in these communities, they operate in a, in a different way from a, a pyramid hierarchy. That's very interesting. Now, you've used the word values three or four times so far in this conversation. Can you talk more about what kind of values are you talking about? What's distinctive about the values that help to create these, we think, kind of organizations? Well, I, I suppose they're, they're values. One is um, the value of purpose. So they're animated by a purpose to make a better thing, um, to provide a better outcome, rather than animated by position or kind of where you stand in a hierarchy. Um, they're animated by values of contribution, so respecting the contribution of other people and animated by the value of sharing, that actually the more we share, the more we create together. So um, some of these were inspired by looking at large scientific collaborations. And the human genome is a very good example that that was mapped by a global team. Most science now is done on an interdisciplinary basis globally with global researchers collaborating, to get, collaborating together. Those collaborations depend on people sharing knowledge. And what they found with the human genome was the more you share, the more you get. So there's this generative dynamic that sets in. The more you put out there, the more you get back. That's true of life in general, though, isn't it? It is. And so one of the, but what I think one of the things that's happening with more collaborative and open forms of innovation, which is now coming about, is that if you hoard things, you don't get more value. You actually get shot out of the network. Exactly. So you need to keep, I draw this analogy that one of the best organizations which I think embodies this philosophy is Barcelona Football Club. And Barcelona Football Club, the way that Barcelona play football, the ball is always in motion. It's always being passed around. No one ever hoards it. And that's the way you've got to think. You've always got to be able to pass because it's by keeping the ball in motion that you create more value. If someone keeps control of it and says, no, it's my ball, I must have it, then everything breaks down. Yeah. Are there any corporations that you can think of exemplify this particularly well? 
Well, I think there are more and more corporations who are trying to do things like this, and you certainly see um, an organisation like Pixar, which is um, both very controlled and commercial, but also within Pixar has a very, very sort of egalitarian, flat feel to it and sort of community feel to it. And of course, emerging out of the internet, you see more organisations which are working more rapidly with their consumers and communities of consumers around them, whether that's social media or games companies. The games companies are, 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 have um, sort of led the way, I suppose, in understanding they have to engage with their communities to get those communities to contribute to the game. And the, the game is really a platform for communities to build stuff around rather than being a passive audience. Are there any companies, organizations, industries that you think do not lend themselves to this? Well, what I say to companies is when I talk about this kind of stuff is that it might be the case that your industry is immune, that if you're in chemicals or consumer goods or even in legal services, it might be that your industry is immune to these things, that actually in your industry it will remain closed and so on and so forth. But it's a big risk to assume that it will. Even consumer goods, because that strikes me as something... Well, even in consumer goods, um, well, for, for several reasons. I mean, one is that every purchase we make now is accompanied by information, by some aspect of social media, of comparison, of feedback, so on and so forth. So there's nothing which is completely immune to that. These organizations are employing people who are now being brought up with social media. So the people you're leading will now be used to communicating laterally, finding information out, using the web. So um, one way or another, organizations will be affected either on the labor market side, because the people they're employing have this culture, or on the demand side, that more of their consumers will be used to the idea of being able to compare, rate, have their voice heard, make a suggestion, give feedback. And then we need to adjust around that. Yeah, and so yeah. no organization can now think, I'm not going to have a conversation with my consumers because the consumers will start having a jet conversation. Engines, jet engines, heavy military, maybe. Well, maybe, but even there, as we've seen, actually, yeah. you know, you can, communities can form around all sorts of things. It's, yeah. But it's dangerous for now for companies to assume that they don't need to be part of this conversation and that there's going to be no conversation going on. Yeah, interesting. Another uh, concept you talked about is the conditions that are needed for we think to succeed. The leader, the, the, the uh, sort of the, the catalyst, the crystal, the core of this whole thing. Uh, anything more to say about the conditions? Well, I think there's a, that we've been through a period where companies for a time thought that all you needed to do was sort of open up and launch a wiki and so on and so forth. Actually, these things need careful tending. So um, you need to pose an interesting question. You need to understand what will help people contribute, why they'll contribute. You need to make it easy for them to contribute. You need to find ways to connect people together in some way to sort of govern the community as well. So it's not just a question of sort of giving people technology and then they start collaborating and finding things out. You've got to nurture those environments and conditions and it's like tending to a garden or something like that. You can't plan it, but if you just let it go, it might just end up being chaotic. A bunch of weeds. A bunch of weeds. Yeah. You mentioned in your book that leadership in, in many places has become, and here I quote, uh, bonus-driven performance management as opposed to true leadership. Yeah. And so as I think about what you say and this garden that can be created that's going to be more free-flowing with multiple sources and more self-management and openness and conversation yeah. and communication and all this stuff. But you've got these people who are, you know, an installed yeah. base of leaders, yeah. quote-unquote, who may not quite get yeah. um, what this requires. Or if they get it, it might actually be really hard for them yeah. to make the shift because yeah. they've grown up in a completely different system. Yeah. They've been rewarded on a different basis. Their mm. identity is doing what they do. Mm. What have you encountered in your work um, around that? And what recommendations or what do you do to help people make a shift? Maybe it's not as hard as I think, but it strikes me as it would be tough for some no, people. No, I think it's really hard because yeah. I think that, um, I, I think it's really hard because those behaviors are very ingrained. 
and in many of the big organisations that I deal with, both public and private, it's almost like there's a civil war going on, a civil war between leaders who kind of feel they should be leading and taking responsibility and taking action and giving direction and employees who feel they should be doing jobs which have more discretion, more scope for their own advancement and things like that. And I think worldwide there is now a trend amongst younger people in their 20s and 30s who regard authority, if not with scepticism, then certainly as something that needs to prove itself before it's legitimate. And your title doesn't matter so much as how you behave, what your values are and what you do. So I think there's this tremendous tension. Where, where do you find companies who've found a way around that or trying to adapt it? Well, one very interesting company, I think, is Unilever, um, led by a fantastic CEO, Paul Ploman. Um, Paul Ploman runs a marathon for charity every year. He's got deeply held values of his own. He talks openly about those values. And he's very deliberate about trying to create a culture in which people take responsibility for their work their actions, and in which the company is not just a way to make money, it's a way to achieve some sort of social purpose. So now they're talking about each Unilever brand being identified with a social cause in some sense, and taking the lead on issues about, say, water usage and what have you. So I think that's an example of a, a very old traditional company which is trying to reshape itself. But he's a very experienced, very um, thoughtful kind of social business leader. But I think that he's the kind of person that we're going to need more of, who can recognise that to create value you have to share value and you have to show that you're creating value for society as well as for your company. Do you know enough about the Unilever example to know if he faced much in the way of resistance or if as he you know, gained the, the, the power and influence to be able to create the organisation that he wanted to create if he encountered much in the way of skepticism in the organization, was there much in the way of turnover or oh, I think people, there was were people just eager to sign up for yeah. this? Were people no, I, well, waiting for this man to take over? I think all of that, actually. Yeah. yeah. So I think there were lots of people waiting. Um, I think there's a huge pent-up kind of yearning in lots of companies for a sense of purpose and dynamism and, and kind of optimism about organizations. But I think there's a lot of inertia as well, if not direct resistance, inertia. But I think the other thing that is also true that we shouldn't underestimate is that um, it, it won't all go according to plan, that actually persuading people to operate in these new ways you know, is quite difficult. So I know for a fact that Unilever is you know, trying to do some really in, interesting and ambitious things about creating new products which use less water. So. FMCG and consumer goods companies, soaps, detergents, they're associated with using lots of water. Well, actually trying to get people to use less water is a very, very difficult thing to do. It's easier to sell detergent than it is to change behaviour over water. So, you know, what that means, what does it mean to be a company that's concerned with trying to change behaviour for the better? That's a big undertaking. So it's not to be underestimated, but the benefits in the long run of a leadership which says our job is to set some clear rules and some clear values and some sort of objectives but to create the conditions in which other people make the best decisions and use their best talents. That, that general shift towards that kind of leadership is going to become much, much more common, I think. You said something interesting now, many things interesting just now, but one in particular uh, is in the long run. And of course, what mitigates against a lot of uh, sort of corporate social responsibility um, is the short term, long term. Yeah. So, how much patience have people had? I don't know if Unilever is the right example, but another example. Uh, does this has this affected their corporate profits? How is this being received by the outside world, by the by the outside yeah. stakeholders? Yeah. Um, the shareholders and other stakeholders yeah. who are interested in seeing Unilever succeed quarter to quarter to quarter. Yeah. So I think that's a, an ongoing challenge that um, companies need to feel that they can deliver to financial markets and to investors and to that kind of pressure as well as to these social objectives. But have they been profitable? Unilever as Oh yeah, no, so Unilever, ha yeah, yeah. no, Unilever has been profitable. There are lots of arguments about other cases. 
For instance, Pepsi is in the middle of a very big attempt to do something similar, particularly around water. Uh, but in the long run, I just don't think there's a way that companies are going to be able to make money whilst trashing the environment and reneging on social commitments to communities where they work. That and in getting the long people to sign up to work with them. Yeah, and getting, and particularly one of the things that I hear time and time again now is from, oh, I was with a big financial institution in London, not one I expected to say this, who said, we now can't employ people from university unless we can tell them they're going to have interesting jobs in which they'll be have the opportunity to do something socially purposeful. So we just can't compete to attract talent now unless we do more than give them jobs with money. So that... It's that actually very heartwarming. Well, yeah, it's heartwarming that. and it, it's something I've heard from many companies of all sorts of different kinds, but it suggests that the generation that they are now recruiting it is expecting something different and that, that in addition one of the things that these young people are saying is that they'll prepare to work for a while for a company but actually if it's not really interesting and it's not really doing something valuable they'll use that experience as a basis for then going off and starting something themselves. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're dealing now with a generation that looks at its careers in a, in a very different kind of way. Are there any downsides of all this openness and sharing and communication that, uh, that you've seen? Well, I, I, don't, I am a great believer in it. So I think that the way forward is for companies to be like this and that the more that companies create a sense that they are bringing people together in a shared purpose and they're doing that by sharing information, sharing rewards, sharing responsibility, that's the way forward. The downsides are is if you do it stupidly, I suppose, and you just expect people to um, be able to start doing it without any support or without any guidance, without any structure or any purpose, any rewards. Um, so it's very important, for instance, to work out what, what motivates people to want to share. It's not money. Um, usually it's recognition and it's the opportunity to do something useful. So you can set the wrong incentives for these things, or you can create the wrong conditions, or you can, do, you can say one thing and do another thing. Yeah. So there are all sorts of different ways in which companies will, will, will fall foul of it or get, get it wrong. Uh, and companies find it, I think, really difficult. They, they want to believe that they're like this, but actually the, the tendencies to you know, go in the other direction. How do you help them to see themselves? That has to be part of the role that you play when you consult to a company. Well, how do you help, or how do you help a leader to see himself or herself? Someone who thinks, hey, I'm very empowering. I completely uh, help my people to manifest their own destinies, yeah. right? In the meantime, you talk to the people and they say, my boss is a control freak. Yeah. H how do well, you help them to see themselves? Yeah. I mean, there t I suppose there are two things that happen to be, to be realistic in those situations. I'm just thinking about a company that I was with last week where, where the message from the senior management is we want a socially responsible, simple, helpful organization which is out, you know, prime purposes to help consumers and help the communities that we serve. But, uh, if you listen to the senior middle management, they say we've got lots of rules, hierarchy, you know, we can't do anything, we're disempowered, so on and so forth. Well, what, what's the solution to that? Well, one is the feedback to the senior management that you, you, you've got to be honest about what you're trying to do and you've got to live up to it and realize the, the walk constraint, the walk the talk. But the other is that often there's more space in organizations than people realize. That, that one of the so problems. People are with, putting constraints around themselves. Well, one of the big problems, yeah, yeah. So I find that the big problem with command and control in organizations is not that there's someone at the top commanding and controlling but actually that people think they're being commanded and controlled and the mindset they is... They imagine all sorts of Yeah, they, 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 and partly and they because they feel, partly because of fear, but also because partly it makes them feel more comfortable as well because... And they actually, don't have to step up. Exactly. So they say, I can't do it because there are so many rules and restrictions. Learned and helplessness so is the phrase exactly. I've heard, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of that. And so I think there are a lot of people, um, I'm thinking of, say, the banks in the UK, where you know the banks have behaved in a really socially reckless way in many ways they've made profits at the expense of the economy and society in, in many ways and now a new generation of leaders is trying to change that but many of the people they're trying to lead are now very skeptical 
about the messages that they're being told. And there is a sense of learned helplessness, which yeah. is, I can't do it, you know. Yeah, so yeah. So. I've actually heard that rep uh, interest in financial services in business schools has actually declined right. as a result of, right. of all the recent yeah. scandal. Yeah. Interesting. Any final words? Well, uh, just that I think that this agenda about kind of shared leadership is, is the way that things are going to go, that leaders in all walks of life are only going to be lead, are only going to be able to lead through influence in future, fundamentally, through their ability to influence other people and provide them with a sense of purpose and meaning. And that's true in politics and it's also true in business. Very good. I wish we had more time. I've really enjoyed thank speaking you. with you. Uh, Charles Lee led Beter. Thank you very much for joining us at the Leaders' Room. Thanks very much indeed. Okay. Uh, this is Kate Sweetman, and thank you for joining us in the Leaders' Room. It's a wrap.